do want to make this as interactive as a discussion as possible. Um, so let me just start. Um, I'd love anyone, um, we've only got about 42 on here, so if a few people are willing to um, kind of share their video, it'd be nice to see some faces out there. Uh, and let me just ask, so I manage the Teaching Academy program. Let's get everybody kind of uh, using Zoom here. Can you, in your participant box, uh, check yes or no? Have you heard about the Teaching Academy? How good of a job am I doing promoting this program? <laughs> I see a lot of, um, I see some familiar faces on here and some not. Oh, these are great. I love the green. Don't be shy. You can say no if you haven't. And uh, we've got some folks saying yes in the chat box. Um, so great, I just wanted to kind of warm us up here a little bit. Uh, and feel free, please, um, you can also raise your hand. It'll show me who's, um, who's put their hand up. Hi, Rachel. Uh, um, hi, Tusa. Good to see some familiar faces here. Hi, Robert. <laughs> Um, so feel free to raise your hand and I can take questions. Um, doesn't have to be a question, it can be a comment, a thought. Uh, I'd love to make this as interactive as possible. So today uh, we're gonna, so I'm used to talking about teaching topics, writing effective teaching statements, uh, reviewing teaching philosophies, helping you develop them, looking at your course design, how to engage your students. Uh, so this is um, kind of a relatively newer area for me to talk about in terms of the academic CV and cover letter, but I've certainly uh, spent some time reviewing ap academic packages and um, been part of professional development here at Hopkins for um, the good part of the last eight years. Um, so I think it's definitely an important topic. I'm hoping it's not going to be too dry and kind of nuts and bolts, but um, I'm going to walk you through a process of um, first putting a, pers a hat on of looking at life through the lens of a, a review committee so that you can kind of see what a day in the life of being a member of that committee is before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what makes uh, up the CV and cover letter and what are some kind of do's and don'ts. So today my uh, objectives for you, I'm gonna have to move my kind of zoom boxes around here a little bit so I can see. Um, so our objectives for today, I'd like you by the end of the session to be able to have spent some time thinking more like a search committee member so that you can get recruited by one. And we're gonna cover some do some must haves for your cover letter and CVs and some do's and don'ts um, and some things to avoid for, for those application materials as well. And then at the end, um, I'd like to put together a little mechanism to give you the opportunity to connect with peers um, as well as our offices to be able to have um, some review and uh, ability to get feedback on your application materials as you develop them, including your cover letter and CV. So does anybody, uh, this is a shared process, does that all sound good to you? Thumbs up? Yes, sounds good. Anything else you were expecting that you'd like for us to touch on or cover? Okay, if it comes up, uh, you know, if some, a new idea comes up or something you hadn't thought of during the presentation, feel free to, to chime in. So uh, what are the challenges, and actually with this topic, I think it matters less, is that we are a group here. If we had time, we'd go around and listen um, to you know your name and where you're from and what division and your discipline. And it's a, a really diverse group we've got. So um, there are obviously specifics that are going to be pertinent to your particular discipline. And I've touched upon those in certain areas where I can. Um, I lucked out in this one because you know, the fundamentals of what makes a decent cover letter and a good CV are pretty consistent across um, the academic world. So I'm gonna cover um, those that, the commonalities, I'll point out where I know them, where um, pay attention to something that might be nuanced in your own discipline. Um, but, you know, I'm doing my best to kind of reach everyone here, but this isn't um, going to be, unfortunately, the forum for where we can kind of dive into, you know, your specific situation, which is unique, and your discipline and your job prospects are going to be different depending on 
your experience, what your academic, what your career goals are, and what the job market um, looks like given at the time that you um, go on your search. So those are all things that we can really handle uh, more on a one-on-one -on -one consultation basis, um, but please um, don't take that as a, uh, I'm not dissuading anyone from kind of sharing their story and challenges that they're having in, um, in this forum as well. So I'm gonna dive in. Okay, time to uh, do the Mr. Rogers and change your shoes. Uh, take your graduate shoes and postdoc shoes off and being a job prosking candidate. And I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a search committee. So these are the three questions I um, am gonna spend some time covering here. And hopefully um, the reason behind that will make more sense as we do this. Um, so the first question we're gonna talk about is what is your goal as a search committee member? What are you feeling as a member of this search committee? And who are you looking for, okay? So we're gonna start with the first question of what is your goal? So everyone is now search committee and what is your goal? Can someone kind of chime in and maybe think about or let me know what your what the task that lies ahead of you looks like. I'm giving you a clue with this picture here. <laughs> Have you ever thought about it from that perspective before? Can I chime in here? Yes, please. Uh, I would say that the goal is to fit, to find a, a person who's going to fit a particular spot in your program. So you're not just looking for any old person, you're looking for somebody very specific with a specific discipline or skill set or uh, research interest or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would agree. And I think um, the illustration I'm kind of trying to point you to here is that I was thinking about a jigsaw puzzle and you're giving, oh, let's see, Swati says, finding a candidate who can work with other faculty and also complement research interests. Yep, those are two great criteria metrics that we're gonna talk about today. Um, but when you have a thousand piece puzzle, so in small fields, um, typically a department may get 200 to 300 applications for position in bigger fields up to a thousand applications so if you're trying to put together you know a puzzle and um, you're looking at a thousand pieces but you're only putting together one piece at a time right so you're trying to identify in this big you know um, pile right of applications the best fit how Robert said for your department for the position that you need something that's gonna complement the research interest and, and work with um, the faculty in your department. And those needs and the position description are gonna be different depending on the job posting. So um, let's say for average's sake that you've got a pool of 500 applicants and your job, your first task is to get those down to a pile of 25, right? So this requires rejecting 95% of the applicants just to get to that short list. So that's a acceptance rate, I think of 0.2%, which means your bias going into this is to reject. And I don't wanna scare anyone, but all of this is to um, help you realize how important these documents are in getting you past that initial huge pile. This is where they are um, looking for any easy reason to throw you into that uh, reject pile, okay? So what are you feeling, this daunting task? Let's say you've got 500 applications you've got to review as a search committee member. What is going on in your kind of mental, emotional state? Any great actors out there that <laughs> dread? <laughs> I mean, is this something, think about who you are. You're a faculty, 
you work full time, you've got re overwhelming, Rachel says, you've got research, you've got teaching, maybe you spent the whole day, you had a class to teach, you were in meetings, a faculty committee meeting, you had office hours, you had to meet with your TAs, um, you've got kids in daycare you're rushing to go pick up, then you've got to get dinner, get the kids to bed, now you had some grading to do, some emails to answer, and it's now 10 p.m. at night, and you're sitting down with a stack of 500 applications to go through, right? So this is, um, you know, maybe one scenario. I, I ran through this presentation a little bit with my kids last night, and they said, Mom, that sounds like your life. <laughs> I was like, oh no, right? <laughs> I hope I hope this isn't me all the time. But um, but this is, you know, and, and I'm not saying this is the case in for all uh, in the state of mind that, uh, and I'm gonna give you another example here in a minute. Um, but this is to give you, you know, uh, a kind of perspective into the state of a committee search committee member in terms of what their what their task is to do they're not like oh yes i can't wait to read through all of these application materials it's like not the funnest um thing their to-do list point on their checklist right okay so we're gonna do a little poll you've got all of these uh, I'm gonna launch the poll. You've got all of these applications, letters, and six page CVs sitting in front of you. How long are you gonna spend reviewing a single cover letter and CV? How long are you gonna look at one application at this initial kind of, this is your you know first pass through to get down to that short list that you're gonna go back and talk to your committee members about. Go ahead, do you guys know how to vote? So we're getting some B and A. Can you all see the poll up there? Is it sharing it? You can't see it? Oh, huh. Relaunch, let me relaunch it. Okay, now it might pop up. Now can you see it? Okay, here we go. Now the Zoom fun begins. 30 seconds, two minutes. We've got 33 out of 48 voting, 35. We'll give everyone three more seconds to vote. Oh, everybody's two. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll and let's see who won. Two to three minutes to 30 seconds. So you guys are, you guys are, thinking what I'm thinking, right? I kind of put together this uh, little math here. If you were to spend 20 minutes, you're gonna spend 160 at 67 hours looking at those 500 resumes or CVs um, down to 30 seconds, um, which gives you, I can't see because I have my group chat there, uh, spending three hours on those. So three hours sounds a lot better than 100 and, 67, at least for this initial pass through. And so here's a quote by uh, Karen Kelsky. Uh, this is a, a professor who wrote the book and has a blog that Prof is in. And I know a lot of our graduate students and postdocs uh, look to her um, as a great expert and for good advice on this. And we're gonna, I'm gonna dive into some of her materials later here. Um, but she says, bottom line, if you don't grab and hold them in the first 20 seconds, you're toast, okay? So, um, so what are you looking for as you begin to spend about 30 seconds looking through these applications? What, I want you guys to just spend a minute, if I give you all the answers, you haven't really put yourselves in the shoes of a search committee member. And I think you need to do this to know how to think about making your CV and cover letter the strongest. So what's, what's gonna draw your attention? Just one or two things, and then we'll, we'll get going into more detail here. What do you think the first thing is that your eye's gonna go to when you look, pick, up a, pick up one of the CVs?
Let's see. Rachel says awards demonstrated, research accomplishments, the institution they graduated from, and publications. Yep, those are all good answers and definitely important. So this is um, to get back to the idea of that perfect puzzle piece fit. You know, this is what they're looking for. That ah, oh, I found it, or I'm, you know, I'm interested to know more about this person. This one definitely is going to go into my short list as a strong candidate. So we're going to spend some time now diving into, um, and these are some of the key metrics in the academy, the institution, the about section, someone says a proven record of research. Yep, so we're gonna, these are all great, um, great points that you've brought up here. The area of research and scholarship, your productivity, publications, presentations, the teaching they've done, grant that you've done, grant writing, and that fit, that fit with potential, I think Robert said this, with potential colleagues. How your research, how your personality um, and culture, those things are gonna come out more um, in the opportunity when you get an interview, kind of, um, you know, do you get along with, did they kind of like you? You know, that's kind of um, an un, uh, quantifiable metric, but I think that goes into it, like how well you connected with them when you get to the interview process. Um, these are all key metrics in academia and they continue on at, into what you are, um, what your performance is rated on when you become a faculty member, okay? So let me just peek at the time, how we're doing. Um, this is one, I won't go too much into this, but um, because I'll, I'll have to take the slides down, but I included a link into uh, one inside look at our, a reviewer's perspective. And they actually had a little bit um, different of approach. So they didn't actually, they spent more like 10 minutes on their pile of applications. And they were also, I think a lot of faculty um, have, application um, tools so that they are able to, they're not necessarily printing out the applications and going through the CVs, but they're able to access all of these materials electronically. And so he, this particular reviewer talked about, you know, what they did and how, what criteria they looked at first. And some of the things that you have mentioned were definitely key on, uh, on the things that they first looked at. So I'll just leave that there, something that you can go back to and reference later. So again, now, what I want you to make sure you spend some time doing before you start applying, um, maybe you've already started applying to positions, but is to really get clear about your career goals. Uh, this is a really, really high level perspective on kind of what is out there. Um, maybe you've heard I talked about that there's teaching institutions or there's research institutions and there's really a spectrum. And what um, that means is how you spend your time and how, where your salary comes from is going to be very different given the type of institution you go to. And why is that important? It means that that is what's gonna drive how you are reviewed for annual performance increases, how your promotion and tenure um, track is structured, what's gonna be expected of you, how you're gonna spend your time, um, and that is because your dollars that support your position are going to be coming from different places, depending on how that university is financed. So, um, so look at that and think about, you know, get clear about what your career goals are. And if it is, I'm assuming this particular talk is focused on academic uh, positions. So we know that this is, I'm just speaking in the world of, you know, of colleges and universities. So think about what type of institution that is. And I will, this is all with a caveat that, for example, I'll talk about at Hopkins. So Hopkins is an R1 research institution. And you're going to find positions here that are primarily, if not only, solely research-based. So there, there is that potential to have an option of a career like that here at Hopkins, okay? And that's where you're gonna find those positions. You're not gonna find a research position at a primarily undergraduate institution that doesn't have graduate students and doesn't do research, okay? Um, 
but you also can find teaching track positions here at Hopkins, okay? So that's another um, generality here that I've made that is not necessarily uh, cut and dry, okay? A lot of R1 uh, institutions are building out teaching track faculty positions that have their own promotion um, structure and their own, um, their, a different set of responsibilities. So you can find those different types of positions at comprehensive institutions that have a mix of research and teaching. Loyal is one, I just picked ones that were in this area, in the Baltimore area, um, and at Research One institutions. Uh, you will not find as much research, if any at all, if you are looking at nest, like something like a community college or uh, an, a primarily undergraduate institution that doesn't evolve itself in research, okay? Um, and with that, I will just say, if you're looking at jobs in the research intensive positions, I've heard this question come up, I wanted to mention it, is that these are titles like assistant professor, uh, research associate, research assistant professor, okay? And then at teaching institutions, the titles or the teaching track, we have these at Hopkins too, um, might be visiting assistant professor, adjunct faculty, um, a lecturer, um, assistant professor as well, you'll see. So those are just something to kind of keep in mind um, as you see the, the title of the job posting um, and are looking to figure out, you know, what's going to be the best fit for you. Are there any questions about this or anything right now? I mean, nobody has their hand up? Okay. Okay, so this is the, um, I think this is at the heart of an effective job application that includes a cover letter and a CV, is that you need to align all of your materials. Here is your job application package. So we're, we're taking the shoes off and I'm talking to you now as potential prospects for the job position, okay? So we're no longer in search committee mode. Um, and you are putting together your cover letter, your CV, and all these other supporting job application materials. And they all need to be aligned with that job position. What I see um, I come across and where there's um, things that will quickly get you kind of thrown into that reject pile is, is when your cover letter actually reads for a different job position. Okay, and I know there's a lot of um, positions to apply for and um, but th this is where if they don't feel like you are applying specifically to this position, to their institution, to their department, to be part of one of their colleagues, if they, this is going to show them, this is like the first red flag where they're just going to say, nope they don't even, this isn't even, they didn't even read the job position, right? So what I'm recommending, and I promise we're going to get in nuts and bolts of CVs and cover letters, but I really think this upfront time spent analyzing the job description, knowing what you want for a career position and how you want to spend your time, and what your, you know, your future looks like and where you will be happy is time worth spent into identifying the job postings that are worthwhile for you to go after, okay? And highlighting, really analyze them and get them out and actually, you know, sketch and write down your supporting details of where you have knowledge, skills, and experience that support that job posting and what they're asking for. I think this upfront time can save you on the back end of applying to things where um, it's probably more apparent to them that there's just not a good fit there to begin with. You can do that for them in the beginning. Okay, so here I'm just re-emphasizing that alignment with your experience, your research, your teaching, the skills that you offer aligned with that job posting. Okay, now not all of the time the job postings are kind of clear. Okay, so this is just getting more into detail about, you know, prioritizing your goals, 
going after those positions that are aligned with your career goals, but then um, being able to demonstrate um, what's in your CV that is relevant to that job posting, okay? And one thing I'm gonna say again later, but the cover letter is not a, it should not be redundant to your CV. It should not be something that is saying, oh, you'll, you know, by evidence by my CV. This is, this is not what you want to do with your cover letter, okay? Um, and we'll get into what you do want to do with an amount. So the job posting tells you something, right? But it doesn't tell you everything. And this is another point where I really want to um, emphasize some upfront research on your own part will pay off, I think, in dividends in the end. So what do you need to know? Find out about the institution. You can learn a lot about a university by just going to its webpage and spending, spending some time browsing it. Read the mission statement of that institution. Read um, the, really read the department's webpage. Read the people that are part of the department. Read the faculty, read their profiles, read their bios, know what they do. Do you see yourself fitting in with this group of scholars, right? Find out if you align with them before they have to find out that themselves, right? You can do a lot of this um, upfront work to before you apply for the job posting and it'll give you a better sense of how to make sure your cover letter and CV are fitting in with this particular job posting. Um, I encourage everyone, this is where social capital comes into play. Who do you know? Who do you know that might know someone? I think, you know, it does, it can help if you, um, you know, have a colleague or a friend or someone that can um, help you network with that university. And um, don't be afraid to call or email either the contact listed on the job posting or the department chair of the position because, um, I think this falls in line with what I've experienced with going after grants when they have these open kind of office hours where you can get, um, actually talk to, you know, the um, granting agency, find out more about what they're looking for. This holds true for um, finding out more about the kind of candidate they're looking for. And I, um, I really think they look favorably on someone who's being kind of proactive and you have to have good questions, you know, that you're coming to them with, but you're, you're asking to find out more about the job position so that you can position yourself as a strong candidate for it. So, this is just to recap what we've talked about. Um, the fit is important. Robert started us off with that today. You really want to show how your experience is lined with the position description. Your productivity is really important, and we're going to get into some details about that. Um, and then, of course, um, other important qualifications um, that are specified in the job ad. You want to make sure that they are there and they're in a prominent place um, on your CV. Uh, they care about um, pedigree, your advisors, your labs, um, your time to degree. So these are all important uh, kind of metrics that they're gonna be analyzing your CV for. So hopefully by now, I have convinced you all that this is not the way to go with your how you create your job application materials. This copy, paste, 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 right? You really want to tailor it um, to the position. I know that takes more time and it's overwhelming, um, but this is your, you know, your opportunity to get your, um, to get that, get yourself down to that short list, okay? And make sure that you have the opportunity to um, get in front of them and talk to them in person about your research, your experience, and why um, you would be the best candidate for the position. Okay, so does anybody have any um, kind of questions, comments, or thoughts right now? We're gonna dive into more of the nitty gritty and some advice from the experts that I'm, that I'm gonna uh, bring to you all on what makes a good CV and cover letter but I really thought that I wanted to hone in on that kind of upfront. I think a lot of times people just like go out there, you find a template, 
you know, you plug in your stuff and you submit the stuff. And I really think this upfront time is important to do to research the position, to find out, to uh, reflect about on your own about why that this position is intriguing to you or of interest to you, what you want to do with your your career goals. Um, I think all of that is makes you a stronger applicant and it will be reflected naturally in the application materials you put together. Okay, so I don't see any hands or questions at this time. So we are gonna dive into uh, some advice from the experts. So we have Karen here and this is Brian's one of my colleagues at, um, at UNC Chapel Hill. He's a teaching professor and assistant dean. Um, and he's also uh, heads up associate director for the SPIRE program there, post postdoc teaching postdoctoral fellowship. Actually, Rachel's um, part of one of our postdocs that is in uh, the Hopkins uh, equivalent program. So I'm gonna to bring to you, so some of this is a combination of their expert advice, because they've been doing this a little bit longer than I have, but um, I've also woven in kind of my two cents and perspective, and I've also kind of curated what I thought was, you know, kind of more sound common advice, because you can do a, a web search and find all sorts of different uh, conflicting uh, perspectives on this. So I hope at this point I have convinced you that the CV, the cover letter, are your two most important doc documents, and they have to be flawless. We spent some time thinking about, you know, what it must be like as a committee reviewer and uh, their biasness to reject, and um, I can tell you that anything that just kind of sticks out as a mistake or something they're not expecting or just kind of off or unaligned kind of instantly gets you into that that reject pile so really making sure these documents are well reviewed get extra sets of eyes on them they need to be perfect okay right now I'm talking about both cover um, I'm going to just cover generally a little bit about both cover letters are going to be precise concise, they have um, a two page max uh, limit to them, and there's no page limit in your CVs. So they need to be fact-based, not emotion-based documents. So this is not some a place where you are telling a story about the trials and tribulations and the hard work you've done to get to this place and to earn these accomplishments. It is really, um, think of yourself as an equal colleague to these, um, to the reviewers. You need to, you're transitioning from a graduate student and postdoc to an equal uh, colleague, and you need to present yourself that way so that they see you that way. Okay, so there's no begging, no, <laughs> you know, this is about your accomplishments and you need to be uh, confident but not conceited in how you, how you present this, how you present yourself. Again, so you are focusing on the outcomes of your work and not kind of a narrative storytelling history about kind of how you got there, okay? Um, and that is going to help you stay concise and to highlight your strengths and call those out and to their attention. Um, and that was just to emphasize, it's not, this is not a place to, to story, to story tell. So let's focus first on the cover letter. So this is some advice. It has to be properly formatted. All of this, it's like, you know, learning the uh, proper annotation for your research, your APA and everything. All of this has to be uh, very properly formatted. And I think part of that, it helps um, them. It's how you are f per first presenting yourself, but also from my perspective, um, when I've reviewed a ton of applications for um, say our own internal hiring, 
your eye gets trained and expects to see things in certain places. And when it doesn't, it's, it sticks out as a sore thumb. And so you just kind of toss it aside. Okay. So that's what this proper formatting does. If you have an affiliation at the time of your application, so if you're a graduate student or postdoc at Hopkins, you should use Hopkins letterhead. If you don't have an affiliation at the time of your application, you would either create your own letterhead or for this is for the cover letter, um, or just use a blank paper. But it's particularly you know, appropriate for you to use Hopkins letterhead uh, for your cover letter. You want to follow classic letter formatting conventions, okay? So you're going to include, you can look all this up, but I'll give you it right here. This can be a nice reference document at the end of this. You want to include the date above the recipient's address. Your address does not go on the letter, and the, the date can be left or right justified, but pretty much conventional is you have it left justified followed by the the mailing address. One inch margins all around, 11 or 12 font, no smaller to get to two pages, okay? That's one of those things that sticks out and they're just like, oh, it's too small, I can't read it. These people are old like me, they need reading glasses. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, okay, and I noted this before, two pages max. Um, I think one page is perfectly awesome and I'm going to show you the structure of like how to to format it and what to cover in that one page in a minute. Um, I have noted that the philosophy uh, discipline may sometimes uh, actually have a limit of one page. It's not consistent across that discipline but that's something to note. Uh, but the more concise and to the point you can be here uh, the better. So definitely no more than two pages max. And again, perfect. It's got to be flawless. Have extra, have, you know, our offices help you review them. Um, hopefully I'm gonna connect you with some peers. Get extra set of eyes on it. And this is not a one draft. Have somebody look at it, get it correct, you know, one revision type of cycle. This is a multiple draft, multiple revision document. And it is so important that it's worth the time invested in it. So here is what Karen Kelsky considers her nine paragraph model. And I have amended it because I have also seen suggestions on a more four paragraph model. And so I think this is, there's two kind of ways to approach your cover letter. Um, and this is what you want to cover in your cover letter. Your first paragraph is to introduce yourself. Then you're going to talk about your research. Then you're going to talk about your teaching experience. Then you are going to tailor have a paragraph that tailors you to the job, job description. This is, it's in red because it's the hardest thing to do well, and but this is where you're demonstrating that fit, that alignment with how you, you know, are the best candidate for them and why they should, you know, take a good look at your CV and ask you for that phone interview. And then a one to two sentence closing. Um, you can, get more nuanced, her suggestion here is that, you know, you can break out the paragraphs. They're short, concise paragraphs. Again, all of this can, has to fit into no more than uh, two pages. With, let's focus in on your research, okay? And the line, the faint line going across is where you would divide from page one to page two, okay? So if you're going after a research, a primary research position, who you are and your dissertation, you know, an abstract of the abstract of your dissertation, what your contribution to it was, any publications that are, you know, affiliated with it or came out of it, and then where you look forward to the future. What's the next piece of research that you're building upon from there? All of that is page one, you, okay? And then you can talk about your teaching, why you're a good fit for them, and uh, and I can't, you know, wait to hear back from you closing in a professional manner statement at the end. Now, the one exception to this is 
if you are going after a teaching, a primary teaching position, okay? So this is where the position's focus and what your career goals are. You would actually flip those, okay? And put the paragraph on your teaching up front and then, and, and you definitely in those positions want to elaborate. This isn't just like IT8 a course. And this is where I think experience in um, having some formal pedagogical training that the Teaching Academy offers comes in handy because um, you're not gonna hopefully be using, throwing around buzzwords that don't have a lot of uh, substance to them. So that's something you definitely wanna avoid in your cover letter is throwing out um, any kind of kind of fluff really without any concrete um, backing up of experience. You really want to focus on your experience, what you did, um, why it matters, as opposed to um, th saying things like, I like to use, you know, active learning in my classroom, or I like to take the flipped classroom approach right? Something like that. You want to, to engage my students. You want to, you want to talk about how you teach, how you do your research by using the evidence of what you've already done. So supporting details here matters. Any questions about kind of the structure here on, keep going, watch our time. Okay, I'm going to actually bring these all up so you can just have a comparison, okay? So here's a comparison between weak aspects of a, C, uh, of a CV um, and a cover letter. These kind of go over both. I think I have CV there, but um, actually that's a typo. It should be, um, no, this is correct, sorry. Cover letters, what you don't wanna do for the cover letter is repeat your CV, okay? So it's not a repeat. You don't want to say things like, you can see from my CV I'm qualified, okay? Um, you don't want to have your cover letter be a list. That's again, if you list out your, public, your publications, your courses, your awards, that's just a repeat of your CV, okay? You, if, if it has no connection, that's where this disconnect, cover letters that were actually addressing a different job position or don't tailor the um, the language in that cover letter to that position, you know, are going to be a red flag. And then I talked about this empty statements that aren't substantiated, that fluff stuff. Okay. And then a weak cover letter also has no vision looking forward, right? This is you're at a pivotal place in your career development. This is about where you see yourself growing and the opportunity that being part of this department and having this position is going to give you in terms of developing your research, developing, um, you know, the ideas and the things that you want to bring into fruition. So you want to kind of bring that spirit to your cover letter. This is a, you know, this is an opportunity that is, you know, I hate saying this, but it's a, you know, it is, you want to demonstrate how it's a win-win for both, you know, both you and the department. Okay, and so strong cover letters um, are, kind of, are basically going to do the opposite, right? They're going to um, demonstrate that fit, that your experience explicitly masters with the position. Um, they're going to, you know, this is, all different ways of kind of saying the same thing. So goals alignments are there. It's clear how your research will be successful there. And that is actually one point I want to, um, to talk about because I, it's important to figure out what is not a fit. And I've mentored a lot of graduate students, postdocs on this, is what is a hard fit is if you have some kind of unique research that I'm just gonna kind of make this up or one scenario I've heard that requires a, you know, a certain equipment or something. And the university that you are applying to doesn't have access to that equipment or doesn't have funding to be able to give you access to that equipment. That is a real big hurdle right off the bat for them to consider you for. 
I'm not saying don't go after those positions, but you have to have a real clear demonstration of how, if they have limitations to, to those types of things, how you can continue to be successful there. I will say it can work. So I've had graduate students, I'll give one example. She um, went to more of a, a teaching position at Notre Dame University of Maryland, a tenure track position, um, but was given, given her summers to do continue her research. She kept collaborations and access with her department here at Hopkins to continue summer research. And she was able to demonstrate that she could bring that collaboration and opportunities for the undergrad she'd be working with to that position. So that's an ex example of, but you need to kind of go in and figure out that plan ahead of time so that they're not automatically saying, we can't, you know, support that kind of research here at our university. We don't have the, you know, Hopkins is, um, you know, a well-resourced university and not all universities are going to be as well-funded and well-resourced as Hopkins, okay? All right, I think we covered most of that. Okay, CVs. We're going to kind of run through some of the similar type of thoughts around CVs. Again, properly formatted. Okay, like the cover letter, same font, same margins, no errors, have multiple people review it. Okay, unlike the cover letter, there's not a page limit. So you don't have that two page limit uh, going on with your CV. And formatting is really key here for the CV. There are so many, what we're not gonna do today is look at a lot of examples out there. There's plenty that you can draw from. That's really intentional because I'm trying to encourage you not to go, these are two pretty cookie cutter type of documents, right? There's pretty um, conventional formats for what the cover letter should look like and what the CV should look like. What you, what the challenge is for you is to make, follow those conventions, but make yourself stand out. And that comes from the content and the little bit of voice that you have to kind of, to kind of communicate who you are through those. So I really discourage you from like going to find a template or someone else's and kind of plugging in your stuff because um, I think that when you have experience looking at these documents, it can kind of stick out as some incongruencies or inconsistencies or um, a lack of integrity a little bit may like come through. So you really want to make these your own as much as you can and for them. And so that's why, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time kind of um, looking at good versus bad example cover letters and CVs, okay? But I am going to give you some resources at the end where you can kind of dive in on some of that at your own. But I do encourage you, I think if you kind of go through this process that I'm talking about that we spoke about in the beginning, it's going to help you make, it's going to help you who you are come through these documents and that's, they're, that's who they're looking to hire, okay? Okay, so this, um, I'm kind of couching this as this is the American CV, okay? I'm not, there are um, cultural and formatting and kind of some nuances that are a little bit different, what's, diff what's conventional um, in different countries. So I'm just gonna kind of cover what's the kind of convention if you're applying to jobs in the US. Um, if you are applying for jobs outside the US, you know, we can help you and support you and work, you know, work through what those might be. Um, but there are some subtle differences and things like that. So at the core of the CV, this is the order of which you would present. You have your education, your research. Education comes first, okay? Um, and it's gonna be reverse chronological order. Um, then you go into your research. So I'm not gonna read all this to you, but it'll be a reference that you can use. You'll have these slides afterwards. Your teaching experience in your publications. Again, the same kind of rule follows with your cover letter. If you're going after a, a position that is more teaching focused than research focused, if it's half and half, I still say put your research first. If it's a position that's like 50% research, 50% teaching, 
I would highlight your research first. If it's shifted to the other end of the spectrum where you're gonna be focused on more teaching than research, then put your teaching experience first, okay? Your publications and then um, presentations. The extras are your professional, your non-academic professional experience that would be pertinent to the position that you're applying to. Okay, so if you are um, had some engineering industry experience, for example, that would be included under your professional experience. Um, all of this is if it's pertinent to the job description, okay? Any technical skills, if you have coding skills that are important to your job description, that's where they go professional affiliations. And so this is, um, if you, you definitely need to be and should be a member of your professional affiliations and show that you are, you know, so find, if you aren't already, find out, you know, who are the important professional affiliations, associations to join and be members of so that you can put this on here. If you've done any kind of service for those organizations, here's where you would list it. So if you were a proposal reviewer or if you helped organize a conference, um, that's where you wanna include this information. And then there's other um, important information to include, like if you are multilingual, you're not gonna, if your English is your first language, that's assumed. So you wouldn't include that only if, you know, you also speak uh, Italian or Chinese or something, you would include other languages here and any other relevant skill sets. Um, there could be other relevant topic headings to include that if you have significant um, service that's not tied to your professional affiliations, you would include that here. What you don't want to include is any kind of hobbies or fun facts about yourself. Um, and then I see some. I've seen different recommendations on this. I really think your references is a separate page. I don't think you need to, um, that should be included as part of your CV. Um, not, some people include it as one of the sections and you should have three scholarly references. They'll tell you what you're looking for, but generally you'll see, or be asked for maybe three scholar references um, and one teaching reference. So some general advice around this is to think about kind of the peer review gold star standard in terms of how you would rank your experience. Um, whoops, sorry. And let's see, is there a question? Oh yeah, let me see. If I completed a competitive certificate program, where should that go in the CV? For example, I completed one certificate program in global mental health at Harvard. Where should that go in the CD? CV? Good question from Ashley. So let's go back because you want to, um, there, so maybe I skimmed over it too quick. You should have, an, unless I forgot the award section. Oh, I don't want to go through all of this. So I'm just going to talk to you about it. So um, sometimes you would have, so an extra certification would, I, it could go one of two places. Either if it is something important tied to your research or teaching, I would put it in your research or teaching section. If it is a, um, a separate uh, kind of uh, certification that you had, it would go, um, I think, in this kind of extras section of, you know, of extra, um, it, you know, it could be another heading certification certified in the global mental health at Harvard. Um, it wouldn't go in education. Uh, it depends on, actually, I think it depends. So it could be, if you if it was like a graduate certificate it would be something that would be considered part of your education if it was um yes it would go in its own licensing and certifications section so and i think also on here you can have a separate section um this is a different topic but any kind of awards that you had as well so thinking about that kind of peer review standard, that's kind of how you want to think about 
the things that you've done and you want to rank them accordingly. Okay. So something that's peer reviewed and competitive outranks something that's not peer reviewed and not competitive. And so you really want to focus on the stuff that is peer reviewed and competitive, right? So like if you are invited to a talk outside of your university versus um, a departmental campus talk, right? So those kinds of things, just use that kind of um, framework for kind of evaluating yourself and how you would highlight your achievements. And so I would also consider depending on how much you've been involved in and done to focus on those, those things, I'm just calling the peer reviewed gold standard of your work and consider maybe not adding activities or achievements that may take away from them if um, if that's the case, if you think that somehow they might um, distract from kind of the things you, you want to highlight and showcase. So let's just get everything out here because um, a lot of this, whoops, I covered before. Sorry about that. Go back. Mm. So let's see. So I think um, we talked about most of these things being consistent, no mistakes. Um, everything is done. Um, importance is shown by order, top to bottom and left to right in reverse chronological order. So that's how you want to, to organize everything. And use, um, here is where I think there's an art to your cover, to your CV, is that you want to use formatting to make everything easy to find, right? So follow the general conventions because I think that's what reviewers, when we look at things, we're expecting to see. Okay, if I don't see education, the first thing up, you know, it's like I don't want to go to page four to the bottom to find out your education. Follow those conventions because that's what they're used to seeing, and they're trying to get through this um, information quickly and so they know where to look for you know the information their research their teaching follow this order because it just helps the reviewer out and then use formatting to make that information easy to find and heading and bolding things and underlying certain things okay but don't overdo it so here's where I think you know there's a little bit of an art to using formatting um, to make your CV easy and kind of user friendly, right? Um, and this is where it's helpful to get some advice and, and look at kind of other, you know, ways that other CVs have been um, highlighted or where they've used um, bolding or italics or um, bullets or things like that to find out, you know, what to get some ideas that you think might work well for you. Um, this is uh, also I wanted to point out that when I say publications, we're not just talking about um, publications in journal articles, but depending on your discipline, you're going to have, you know, a different uh, form of publication that is customary for your for your discipline. So these are things that you want to include if you're in art exhibits, collections, gallery affiliations certifications in health fields, um, patents in engineering. So um, this probably is obvious to all of you, but I didn't want to make the point that, um, you know, what is showcasing your work is different in different disciplines, and that's what you want to be using your CV to. So make sure you include, include all of those things. Um, so these are things not to do. Don't worry about the length, okay, of your CV because there is no limit. Um, typical, I will say though, is like three to six maybe pages for early career, um, two to six maybe. Uh, senior scholars can have, you know, this is the curriculum vita is your life's work, right? This is what um, it is a document of. So it can be 15 to, you know, 20 you know, for senior scholars that, you know, put every single presentation they've ever given and everything they've done on there. Um, don't include under unnecessary information. Okay, it's not, um, don't put your interest, your hobbies, demographical, your astrological signs, and kind of being, you know, jokey here, it's not a dating app, but it is in a way, you know, it's not, you know, it is in a way uh, a dating 
uh, <laughs> document, right? So, but in a professional way, you are trying to um, get their interest in wanting to court you <laughs> and be part of their uh, department. Uh, I dissuade any, tr you know, in your um, cover letter or woven into your CV, any attempt at trying to be funny, it's just um, not the place for it. It's a really, your CV is a list of factual information about your accomplishments. Um, and then um, I did come across a warning about um, following advice from um, UK websites on CVs. If you're applying to American jobs, there's, you know, just, be aware that different um, countries kind of have different conventions and what's expected. So just that's something to look into if you're looking at, um, and I included an article here that covers covers that. And don't pad. So this is kind of where we, um, going back to that fluff idea. And what do I mean by padding? Um, presenting a paper multiple times, um, having too many kind of manuscripts in preparation or, you know, paper forthcoming, uh, too much description of your research. When you um, describe your research, it needs to be, you know, an abstract of the abstract. It's, it's short and concise. Um, lots of, don't, you know, include things that say, you know, all these invited lectures, which in reality were actual department seminars. Okay, so this is kind of how they're gonna see through this. So that's why these are red, you know, things that I'm cautioning you against. Um, don't include non-authored publications. Um, this is not your transcript, so don't include a long list of courses that you've taken. Um, class presentations or projects that you've given, this is not the place for that. Um, for teaching, don't, this is not a place for a list of, a long list of all the courses you've taught, a long list of uh, course evaluations from your students. You can highlight those in your teaching philosophy statement. And there's gonna be another workshop on that coming down the road here. Okay, so this is, I'm kind of coming to the end here and wrapping up. I did want to kind of um, put this out there, nod to social media, uh, because after you've made that short list, they're gonna be, as, um, and after they have a phone interview with you, when you're, they're getting down to actually hiring you, um, somebody's probably gonna check you out online and you want to know what your online presence looks like. So I'm encouraging you to search yourself, make sure that what's represented in your application package and who, how you've represented yourself, hopefully with complete transparency in a professional way is aligned with what they're gonna find out on social media, right? So what you say in your CV, um, is going to be differently formatted than what's on LinkedIn, but it should be the same information. It should be consistent. Your degrees, everything like that. Look, um, I had blogs and Facebook um, search yourself, and my kids pointed out that I might want to drop Facebook and include Instagram. So that's <laughs> that's what I did there. Um, and on uh, Twitter, if you are a tweeter, make sure um, that's showcasing, you know, that your professional um, Twitter feed is that you're connected to others in your field, that you're using social media to collaborate, that you're up on current research. You want to make sure that that online world is showing you in the best light and is completely um, aligned and parallels what you've presented, how you've presented yourself in that application package. Because if they find discrepancies there, it's a kind of, it's a red flag to them, okay? And something that they might question you on or be concerned about. Um, my final cautionary tales are, um, Make sure that you're, you think of the word as demonstrating. These documents should demonstrate who you are. You're not telling them, right? You're really trying, there's a difference between um, kind of leaning itself more towards a kind of a conceited way of portraying yourself versus a confident way because you have the experience and the skills and the knowledge that back up um, what you are portraying um, and communicating yourself through these documents. Don't, again, be factual, not overly emotional. And that is 
um, tied to the types of adjectives you're going to use. So be careful about kind of flowerly, you know, overly, um, I keep calling the word fluffy types of adjectives about that you may um, be tended, you may gravitate towards um, in your cover letter because it's a hard document to write. Um, and there's some resources out there that have um, a list of adjectives, you know, that you can kind of look at to think about. It helps um, you find the right word to describe your interest and your work and your beliefs in a very concrete, um, professional grounded way. Okay, and finally, don't go it alone. Okay, ask for help, get colleagues to review your materials, um, reach out to the Futures Office, to the Teaching Academy, to the PDCO. We're all here um, to support you in your job search and your job application. Um, I'm going to um, open up for questions in a minute, but I did want to point to you to some great resources that are also out there online. This is the Chronicle CV Doctor, and I am watching our time, so I'm not going to take time to show you this, but um, if you go to this link, there's some great, in all different disciplines, examples of CVs that are annotated by, by um, Chronicle Reviewer Committee comments, and so I think this is a great resource to help you learn about um, looking at very well done CVs and suggestions that they uh, make to make them even stronger. So that's a great learning tool. Um, for those of you with uh, careers that you're looking for in the humanities and social scientists, this Imagine um, PhD site is another fantastic resource. Um, I just took a screenshot. This faculty job family is where you're gonna find um, resources, help, uh, tip guides on all these different careers. There's one um, particular for faculty, um, if that's something you're looking for. So that's another great resource to check out. Um, also included in the presentation is a list. Um, these are resources that my colleague Brian refers a lot of grad students and postdocs for. So I've listed those here for you. Um, I want to highlight this faculty and other students and postdocs in your departments is another great resource. Hopefully you have um, a supportive mentor in your department that can also talk to you about um, giving you suggestions or feedback on your materials as well. Um, this is a great article, the PhD placement. I definitely recommend looking at that as a resource. And then um, I've kind of curated a list of Karen's posts on covers, cover letters and CVs here for you. So here's a nice, you don't have to go searching and digging through a website for those. It's a nice little curated list of um, some of her posts that I recommend um, that give a lot of great advice and support. Okay, and finally, the last learning objective is that I'm sharing uh, with you all, I wonder if I can post this in the chat. Oh, no, I can't, let me see. I'll have to stop it, but I will in a minute when we take questions. Um, is in case there's any interest, um, one of the big things I like to do at Hopkins is connect people and connect graduate students and connect postdocs. And we're all kind of in this new world right now of living on, I told, Roshni, before we started that um, zoomed out is a new feeling I'm having <laughs> that I had not experienced before. So I get to the end of the day and I'll have a friend say, oh, let's zoom and connect. And I'm like, I can't, I'm zoomed out. <laughs> um, but I wanted to try and help connect you all. So I just set up a really simple Google shared spreadsheet. So if you are looking for a colleague to connect with, you can put in your name, your email address, your discipline, and I set it up so that like um, you could have groups of three. And, and then you all kind of, it's a, a way to self-organize to say, um, look, if I share my cover letter and CV with you, you'll, you'll get feedback from two people, and then you're committing to reviewing two cover letters and two CVs and giving them feedback as well. And you can use this document and hopefully some of the things that you've learned today, as well as those resources to, um, to give some quality feedback on their, on their um, application materials. 
So I hope you all kind of like that idea and take advantage of it. And I just wanted to end by thanking uh, Roshni and the Homewood Postdoc Office for this collaboration and all of you for your time and attention today. So with that, um, I hope there's some questions or comments or thoughts or challenges you're having. I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to Zoom. Looks like we've got some things in the chat. Let's see. We have a feedback. Oh yes, we're at, okay. Why fun facts or hobby is not, in, oh, that was a private message. I can't answer that, but I think, um, okay. So where, that's a great question. Let me say it. So where do you show your personality and the way you fit into the culture of that specific department? The reason I say um, advise not to include those things on your CV um, is that the focus there is really on, they're not, really looking at that, right? So they're not, um, I think if it's relevant to the job position, great. If it's not, they're not, you know, everybody loves gardening and reading, okay? So I, <laughs> I don't mean to say that. That's not what they're looking for in this document. Um, who you are professionally should come through in the cover letter and by the demonstration of what you've done in your CV, those kind of personal things, I do really strongly encourage you to, um, to connect with and share when you get to uh, the phone interview or the, um, um, or the interview process, the in-person site visit, because that's where your personality and kind of your fit with the connecting on a relationship basis with everyone there um, is going to happen. But my advice is not really to, because those kind of fun facts things are not necessarily really um, kind of representative even of like your personality. I mean, but I mean, others may disagree, but um, that's what I found and also what some of the other recommendations um, from others that do a lot of this work have suggested. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, we're also asking if you could please consider answering five questions about the virtual session here um, that's posted. Um, any advice for Ariel says, let me make sure I'm not missing anyone. Okay. Um, any advice for early career PhDs and postdocs who aren't currently on the job market to prepare these materials? Or should we wait until we are applying to work on these materials? No, I, the sooner the better, I say, in getting started for these. It's a lot easier, right, to revise something that you've, al that you've already started um, than to wait until the pressure and the stress of the application cycle is upon you to prepare them. Um, so reach out, um, you know, and it should also help you think about having 